Okay, I think the cat just turned off my video recording. Kicking cat off of laptop. She's also trying to eat my headphone cords. Headphone cords are not good for kittens. Um, neither are power cords. Go away. Go away. Go on. Shoo. Um, it's been a very eventful couple of, well, days since I was last doing this. Um, I talked to 95% of you guys yesterday. Uh, it was really good to hear from you guys, and I do miss you guys a lot, but I'm glad we're all staying home and safe and not getting sick. Um, like Tavildo. Tavildo is unfortunately very sick. He had some... I don't know what, but he's sick. He went to the vet today, and he's sick, so he's in our room alone on a heating pad being sick. Don't be like Tavildo. Be healthy. Wash your hands. Tavildo doesn't wash his hands. He got sick. Chapter five. <laughs> oh, she's back. She says she wants to listen too. She is going to be very helpful and not bite my knees while we're doing this. Chapter five. Nico buys Happy Meals for the dead. At least I got a good night's sleep before the quest, right? Wrong. That night in my dreams, I was in the stateroom of the Princess Andromeda. The windows were open on a moonlit sky, cold wind rustled the velvet drapes. Luke knelt on a Persian rug in front of the golden sarcophagus of Kronos. In the moonlight, Luke's blonde hair looked pure white. He wore an ancient Greek chiton and a white hemation, a type of kind of cape that flowed down his shoulders. The white clothes made him look timeless and a little unreal, like one of the minor gods on Mount Olympus. The last time I had seen him, he had been broken and unconscious after a nasty fall from Mount Tam. Now he looked perfectly fine, almost too healthy. Our spies, uh, excuse me, hang on. Our spies report success, my lord, he said. Camp Half-Blood is sending a quest as you predicted. Our side of the bargain is almost complete. Excellent. The voice of Kronos didn't so much speak as pierce my mind like a dagger. It was freezing with cruelty. Once we have the means to navigate, I will lead the vanguard through myself. Luke closed his eyes as if collecting his thoughts. My lord, perhaps it is too soon. Perhaps Creos or Hyperion should lead. No. The voice was quiet, but absolutely firm. I will lead. One more heart shall join our cause, and that will be sufficient. At last I shall rise fully from Tartarus. But the form, my lord. Luke's voice started shaking. Show me your sword, Luke Castellan. A jolt went through me. I realized I'd never heard Luke's last name before. It had never even occurred to me. Luke drew his sword. Backbiter's double edge glowed wickedly. Half steel, half celestial bronze. I'd almost been killed several times by that sword. It was an evil weapon, able to kill both mortals and monsters. It was the only blade I really feared. You pledged yourself to me, Kronos reminded him. You took this sword as proof of your oath. Yes, my lord, it's just you wanted power. I gave you that. You are now beyond harm. Soon you will rule the worlds of gods and mortals. Do you not wish to avenge yourself, to see Olympus destroyed? A shiver ran through Luke's body. Yes, the coffin glowed golden light filling the room. Then make ready the strike force. As soon as the bargain is done, we shall move forward. First, Camp Half-Blood will be reduced to ashes. Once those bothersome heroes are eliminated, we will march on Olympus. There was a knock on the stateroom doors. The light of the coffin faded. Luke rose. He sheathed his sword, adjusted his white clothes, and took a deep breath. Come in. The doors open. Two Dracine slithered in. Snake women with double serpent, serpent tr trunks instead of legs. Between them walked Kelly, the Impusa cheerleader for my freshman orientation. Hello, Luke. Kelly smiled. She was wearing a red dress, and she looked awesome, but I'd seen her real form. I knew what she was hiding. Mist-matched legs, red, fang red eyes, fangs, and flaming hair. What is it, demon? Luke's voice was cold. I told you not to disturb me. Kelly pouted. Well, that's not very nice. You look tense. How about a nice so shoulder massage? 
Luke stepped away. If you have something to report, say it. Otherwise, leave. I don't know why you're so huffy these days. You used to be fun to hang around. That was before what I, before I saw what you did to that boy in Seattle. Oh, he meant nothing to me, Kelly said. Just a snack, really. You know my heart belongs to you, Luke. Thanks, but no thanks. Now report or get out. Kelly shrugged. Fine. The advance team is ready, as you requested. We can leave. She frowned. What is it? Luke asked. A presence, Kelly said. Your senses are getting dull, Luke. We're being watched. She scanned the stateroom. Her eyes focused right on me. Her face withered into, into a hag's. She bared her fangs and lunged. I woke up with a start, my heart pounding. I could have sworn the impoose's fangs were an inch from my throat. Tyson was snoring in the next bunk. The sound calmed me down a little. I didn't know how Kelly could sense me in the dream, in a dream, but I'd heard more than I wanted to know. An army was ready. An army was ready. Kronos would lead it personally. All they needed was a way to navigate the labyrinth so they could invade and destroy Camp Half Blood. And Luke apparently thought that was going to happen very soon. I was tempted to go wake Annabeth and tell her the tell her middle of the night or not. Then I realized the room was lighter than it should have been. A blue and green glow was coming from the saltwater fountain, brighter and more urgent than the night before. It was almost like the water was humming. I got out of bed and approached. No voice spoke out of the water this time, asking for a deposit. I got the feeling the fountain was waiting for me to make the next mood. Move. I probably should have gone back to bed. Instead, I thought about what I'd seen last night, the weird image of Nico on the banks of the river Styx. You're trying to tell me something, I said. No response from the fountain. All right, I said. Show me Nico D'Angelo. I didn't even throw a coin in, but this time it didn't matter. It was like some other force had control of the water beside I besides Iris, the messenger goddess. The water shimmered. Nico appeared, but he was no longer in the underworld. He was standing in a graveyard under a starry sky. Giant willow trees loomed all around him. He was watching some grave diggers at work. I heard shovels and saw dirt flying out of a hole. Nico was dressed in a black cloak. The night was foggy. It was warm and humid, and frogs were croaking. A large Walmart bag sat next to Nico's feet. Is it deep enough net yet? Nico asked. He sounded irritated. Nearly, my lord. It was the same ghost I'd seen Nico with before, the faint shimmering image of a man. But, my lord, I tell you, this is unnecessary. You already have me for advice. I want a second opinion. Nico snapped his fingers, fingers and the digging stopped. Two figures climbed out of the pole, out of the hole. They weren't people. They were skeletons in ragged clothes. You're dismissed, Nico said. Thank you. The skeletons collapsed into piles of bones. You might as well thank the shovels, the ghost complained. They have as much sense. Nico ignored him. He reached into his Walmart bag and pulled out a twelve pack of Coke. He popped open a can. Instead of drinking it, he poured it into the grave. Let the dead taste again, he murmured. Let them rise and take this offering. Let them remember. He dropped the rest of the Cokes into the grave and pulled out a white bag decorated with cartoons. I hadn't seen one in years, but I recognized it. A McDonald's Happy Meal. He turned it upside down and shook the fries and hamburger into the grave. In my day, we used animal blood, the ghost mumbled. It's perfectly good enough. They can't taste the difference. I will treat them with respect, Nico said. At least let me keep the toy, the ghost said. Be quiet, Nico ordered. He emptied another twelve pack of soda and three more Happy Meals into the grave, then began chanting in ancient Greek. I caught only some of the words, a lot about the dead and memories and returning from the grave. Real happy stuff. The grave started to bubble. Frothy brown liquid rose to the top like the whole thing was filling with soda. The fog thickened. The frog stopped croaking. Dozens of figures began to appear among the gravestones, bluish, vaguely human shapes. Nico had summoned the dead with Coke and cheeseburgers. There are too many, the ghost said nervously. You don't know your own powers. I've got it under control, Nico said, though his voice sounded fragile. He drew his sword, a short blade made of solid black metal. I'd never seen anything like it. It wasn't celestial bronze or steel. Iron, maybe? The crowd of shades retreated at the sight of it. One at a time, Nico commanded. 
A single, fi single figure floated forward and knelt at the pool. It made slurping sounds as it drank. drank. Its ghostly hand scooped french fries out of the pool. When it stood again, I could see it much more clearly. A teenage guy in Greek armor. He had curly hair and green eyes, a sharp a clasp shaped like a seashell on his cloak. Who are you? Nico said. Speak! The young man frowned as if trying to remember. Then he spoke in a voice like dry, crumbled paper. I am Theseus. No way, I thought. This couldn't be THE Theseus. He was just a kid. I'd grown up hearing stories about him fighting the Minotaur and stuff, but I'd always pictured him as this big, huge, buff guy. The ghost I was looking at wasn't strong or tall, and he wasn't any older, older than I was. How can I retrieve my sister? Nico asked. Theseus's eyes were lifeless as glass. Do not try. It is madness. Just tell me. My stepfather died, Theseus remembered. He threw himself into the sea because I thought he thought I was dead in the labyrinth. I wanted to bring him back, but I could not. Nico's, go Nico's ghost hissed. My lord, the soul exchange. Ask him about that. Theseus scowled. That voice. I know that voice. No, you don't, you fool, the ghost said. Answer the lord's questions and nothing more. I know you. Theseus insisted as if struggling, struggling to recall. I want to hear about my sister, Nico said. Will this quest into the labyrinth help me win her back? Theseus was looking for the ghost, but apparently couldn't see him. Slowly, he turned his eyes back on Nico. The labyrinth is treacherous. There is only one thing that saw me through. The love of a mortal girl. The string was only part of the answer. It was the princess who guided me. We don't need any of that, the ghost said. I will guide you, my lord. Ask him if it is true about an exchange of souls. He will tell you. A soul for a soul, Nico asked. Is it true? I must say yes, but the specter... Just answer the questions, knave, the ghost said. Suddenly, around the edges of the pool, the other ghosts began, became restless. They stirred, whispering in nervous tones. I want to see my sister, Nico demanded. Where is she? He is coming, Theseus said fearfully. He has sensed your summons. He comes. Who? Nico demanded. He comes to find the source of this power, Theseus said. You must release us. The fountain, the water in my fountain began to tremble, humming with power. I realized the whole cabin was shaking. The noise grew louder. The image of Nico in the graveyard started to glow until it was painful to watch. Stop, I said out loud. Stop it. The fountain began to crack. Tyson muttered in his sleep and turned over. Purple light threw horrible, ghostly shadows on the cabin walls, as if the specters were escaping right out of the fountain. In desperation, I uncapped Riptide and slashed at the fountain, cleaving it in two. Salt water spilled everywhere, and the great stone font crushed. Great stone cr font crashed to the floor in pieces. Tyson snorted, muttered, but he kept sleeping. I sank to the ground, shivering from what I'd seen. Tyson found me there in the morning, still staring at the shattered remains of the saltwater fountain. Just after dawn, the, group, the quest group met at Zeus's fist. I'd packed my knapsack, thermos with nectar, baggy of ambrosia, bedroll, rope, clothes, flashlights, and a lot of extra batteries. I had riptide in my pocket. The magic shield slash wristwatch Tyson had made for me was on my, wi on my wrist. It was a clear morning. The fog had burned off and the sky was blue. Campers would be having their lessons today, flying pegasi and watching archery and or practicing archery and scaling the lava wall. Meanwhile, we would be heading underground. Juniper and Grover stood apart from the group. Juniper had been crying again, but she was trying to keep it together, for Grover's sake. She kept fussing with his clothes, straightening his rasta cap and brushing goat fur off his shirt. Since we had no idea what we would encounter, he was dressed as a human, with a cap to hide his horns, jeans, fake feet, and sneakers to hide his goat, goat legs. Chiron, Quintus, and Mrs. O'Leary stood with the other campers who'd come to wish us well, but there was too much activity for it to feel like a happy send-off. A couple of tents had been set off by the rocks for guard duty. Beckendorf and his siblings were working on a line of defensive spikes and trenches. Chiron had decided we needed to guard the labyrinth exit at all times, just in case. 
Annabeth was doing one last check on her supply pack. When Tyson and I came over, she frowned. Percy, you look terrible. He killed the water fountain last night, Tyson confided. What? she asked. Before I could explain, Chiron trotted over. Well, it appears you are ready. He tried to sound upbeat, but I could tell he was anxious. I didn't want to freak him out any more, but I thought about last night's dream, and before I could change my mind, I said, Uh, hey, Chiron, can I ask you a favor while I'm gone? Thank you. Of course, my boy. Be right back, guys. I nodded towards the woods. Chiron raised an eyebrow, but he followed me out of, the, out of earshot. Last night, I said, I dreamed about Luke and Kronos. I told him the details. The news seemed to weigh on his shoulders. I feared this, Chiron said, against my father Kronos, who would stand no chance in a fight. Chiron rarely called Kronos his father. I mean, we all knew it was true. Everybody in the Greek world, god, monster, or titan, was related to one another somehow. But it wasn't exactly Chiron liked to brag about. Oh, my dad is the all-powerful evil titan lord who wants to destroy western civilization. I want to be just like him when I grow up. Do you know what he meant about a bargain? I asked. I am not sure, but I fear they sp seek to make a deal with Daedalus. If the old inventor is truly alive, if he has not been driven insane by millennia in the labyrinth, well, Kronos can find ways to twist, twist anyone to his will. Not anyone, I promised. Chiron managed to smile. No, perhaps not anyone. But Percy, you must be aware. I have worried for some time that Kronos may be looking for Daedalus for a different reason not just passage through the maze. What else would he want? Something Annabeth and I were discussing. Do you remember what you told me about your first trip to the Princess Andromeda? The first time you saw the golden coffin? I nodded. Luke was talking about raising Kronos, little pieces of him appearing in the coffin every time someone new joined his cause. And what did Luke say they would do when Kronos had risen completely? A chill went down my spine. He said they would make Kronos a new body, worthy of the forges of Hephaestus. Indeed, Chiron said. Daedalus was the world's greatest inventor. He created the labyrinth, but much more. Aut automatons, thinking machines. What if Kronos wishes Daedalus to make him a new form? That was a real pleasant thought. We've got, we've got to get to Daedalus first, I said, and convince him not to. Chiron stared off into the trees. One other thing I do not understand. This talk of a last soul joining their cause, that does not bode well. I kept my mouth shut, but I felt guilty. I had made the decision not to tell Chiron about Nico being a son of Hades. The mention of souls, though. What if Kronos was talking about Nico? What if he managed to turn him evil? It was almost enough to make me want to tell Chiron, but I didn't. For one thing, I wasn't sure Chiron could do anything about it. I had to tell ne find Nico myself. I had to explain things to him, make him listen. I don't know, I said at last, but uh, something Juniper said maybe you should hear. I told him about how the tree nymph had seen Quintus poking around the rocks. Chiron's jaw tightened. That does not surprise me. It doesn't sur You mean you knew? Percy, when Quintus showed up at camp offering his services, well, I would have to be a fool not to be suspicious. Then why did you let him in? because sometimes it is better to have someone you mistrust close to you, so you can keep an eye on him. He may be just what he says, a half-blood in search of a home. Certainly he has done nothing openly that would make me question his loyalty, but believe me, I will keep an eye. Annabeth trudged over, probably curious why we were taking so long. Percy, you ready? I nodded. My hand slipped into my pocket, where I kept the ice whistle Quint Countess had given me. I looked over and saw Quintus watching me carefully. He raised his hand in farewell. Our spies report success, Luke had said. The same day we decided to send a quest, Luke had known about it. Take care, Chiron told us, and good hunting. You too, I said. We walked over to the rocks where Tyson and Grover were waiting. I stared at the crack between the boulders, the entrance that was about to swallow us. Well, Grover said nervously, goodbye, sunshine. Hello, rocks, Tyson agreed. And together, the four of us descended into darkness. And thus ends chapter five. Chapter six.
It's actually not that much longer than chapter five. I might read two chapters. I'd ask your opinion whether or not I should read two chapters, but you can't answer me. Only at 20 minutes, though, and this chapter is only a few pages long. So, chapter six. We meet the god with two faces. We made it a hundred feet before we were hopelessly lost. The tunnel looked nothing like the one Annabeth and I had stumbled into before. Now it was round like a sewer, constructed of red brick with iron-barred portholes every ten feet. I shined a light through one of the portholes out of curiosity, but I couldn't see anything. It opened into infinite darkness. I thought I heard voices on the other side, but it may have just been the cold wind. Annabeth tried her best to guide us. She had this idea that we should stick to the left wall. If we keep one hand on the left wall and follow it, she said, we should be able to find our way out again by reversing course. Unfortunately, as soon as she said that, the left wall disappeared. We found ourselves in the middle of a circular chamber with eight tunnels leading out. No idea how we'd gotten there. Uh, which way did we come in? Grover said nervously. Just turn around, Annabeth said. We turned. We each turned toward a different tunnel. It was ridiculous. None of us could decide which way led back to camp. Left walls are mean, Tyson said. Which way now? Annabeth swept her flashlight beam over the archways of the eighth tunnel. As far as I could tell, they were identical. This way, she said. How do you know? I asked. Deductive reasoning. So you're guessing. Just come on, she said. The tunnel she'd chosen narrowed quickly. The walls turned to gray cement and the ceiling got so low that pretty soon we were hunching over. Tyson was forced to crawl. Grover's hyperventilating was the loudest noise in the maze. I can't stand it anymore, he whispered. Are we there yet? We've been down here maybe five minutes, Annabeth told him. It's been longer than that, Grover insisted. And why would Pan be down here? This is the opposite of the wild. We kept shuffling forward. Just when I was sure the tunnel would get so narrow it would squish us, it opened into a huge room. I shined my light down the walls and said, Whoa! The room was covered in mosaic tiles. The pictures were grimy and faded, but I could still make out the colors. Red, blue, green, gold. The frieze showed the Olympian gods at a feast. There was my dad Poseidon with his trident, holding out grapes for Dionysus to turn into wine. Zeus was parting with satyrs, and Hermes was flying through the air on his winged sandals. The pictures were beautiful, but they weren't very accurate. I had seen the gods. Dionysus was not that handsome. Hermes' nose was not that big. In the middle of the room was a three-tiered fountain. It looked like it hadn't held water in a long time. What is this place, I muttered. It looks... Roman, Annabeth said. Those mosaics are about 2,000 years old. But how can they be Roman? I wasn't that great on ancient history, but I was pretty sure the Roman Empire had never made it as far as Long Island. The labyrinth is a patchwork, Annabeth said. I told you it's always expanding, adding pieces. It's the only work of architecture that grows by itself. You make it sound like it's alive. A groaning noise echoed from the tunnel in front of us. Let's not talk about it being alive, Grover whimpered. Please? All right, Annabeth said. Forward. Down the hall with the bad sounds, Tyson said. Even he looked nervous. Yeah, Annabeth said. The architecture is getting older. That's a good sign. Daedalus's workshop would be in the oldest part. That made sense, but soon the mazes were... The soon the maze was toying with us. We went fifty feet and the tunnel turned back to cement, with brass pipes running, running down the sides. The walls were spray-painted with graffiti. A neon tagger sign read, Ma's Rules. I am thinking this is not Roman, I said helpfully. Annabeth took a deep breath, then forged ahead. Every few feet the tunnels twisted and turned and branched off. The floor beneath us changed from cement to mud to bricks and back again. There was no sense to any of it. We stumbled into a wine cellar, a bunch of dusty bottles and wooden racks, like we were walking through somebody's basement, only there was no exit above us, just more tunnels leading on. Later the ceiling turned to wooden planks. I could hear voices above us and the creaking of footsteps, as if we were walking under some kind of bar. It was reassuring to hear people, but then again we couldn't get to them. We were stuck down here with no way out. Then we found our first skeleton. He was dressed in white clothes, like some kind of a uniform. A wooden crate with glass bottles sat next to him. A milkman, Annabeth said. What? I asked. They used to deliver milk? Yeah, I know what they are, but that was when my mom was little, like a million years ago. What's he doing here? Some people wander in by mistake, Annabeth said. 
Some go exploring on purpose and never make it back. A long time ago, the Cretan sent, even sent people in here as human sacrifices. Grover gulped. He's been down here a long time. He pointed to the skeleton's bottles, which were coated with, coated with white dust. The skeleton's fingers were clawing at the brick wall like he had died trying to get out. Only bones, Tyson said. Don't worry, goat boy. The milkman is dead. The milkman doesn't bother me, Grover said. It's the smell. Monsters. Can't you smell it? Tyson nodded. Lots of monsters, but underground smells like that. Monsters and dead milk people. Oh, good, Grover whimpered. I thought maybe I was wrong. We have to get deeper into the maze, Annabeth said. There has to be a way to the center. She led us to the right, then the left, through a corridor of stainless steel like some kind of air shaft, and we arrived back in the Roman tile room with the water fountain. This time, we weren't alone. What I noticed first were his faces. Both of them. They jutted out from either side of his head, staring over his shoulders, so his head was much wider than it should have been, kind of like a hammerhead shark's. Looking straight at him, all I saw were two overlapping ears and mi mirror image sideburns. That, that would be kind of weird. Nope. He was dressed like a New York City doorman, a long black overcoat, shiny shoes, and a top hat that somehow managed to stay on his double-wide head. Well, Annabeth? His left said his left face. Hurry up! Don't mind him, said the right face. He's terribly rude. Right this way, miss. Annabeth's jaw dropped. Uh, I don't... Tyson frowned. That funny man has two faces. The funny man has ears, you know, the left face scolded. Now come along, miss. No, no, the right face said. This way, miss. Talk to me, please. The two-faced man regarded Annabeth as best as he could out of the corners of his eyes. It was impossible to look at him straight without focusing on one side or the other. And suddenly I realized that's what he was asking. He wanted Annabeth to choose. Behind him were two exits, blocked by wooden doors with huge iron locks. They hadn't been there our first time through the room. The two-faced doorman had a silver key, which he kept passing from his left hand to his right hand. I wondered if this was a different room completely, but the frieze of the gods looked exactly the same. Behind us, the doorway we'd come through had disappeared, replaced by more mosaics. We wouldn't be going back the way we came. The doors are closed, Annabeth said. Duh, the man's left face said. Where do they lead? She asked. One probably leads the way you wish, wish to go, the right face said encouragingly. The other leads to certain death. I, I know who you are. Annabeth said. Oh, you're a smart one, the left face sneered. But do you know which way to choose? I don't have all day. Why are you trying to confuse me, Annabeth said. The right face smiled. You're in charge now, my dear. All the decisions are on your shoulders. That's what you wanted, isn't it? I... We know you, Annabeth, the left face said. We know what you wrestle with every day. You know, we know your indecision. You will have to make your choice sooner or later, and the choice may kill you. I didn't know what they were talking about, but it sounded like but it sounded like it was more about a choice between more than a choice between doors. The color drained out of Annabeth's face. No, I don't leave her alone, I said. Who are you anyway? I'm your best friend, the right face said. I'm your worst enemy, the left face said. I'm Janus, both faces said in harmony. God of doorways, beginnings, endings, choices. I'll see you soon enough, Percy Jack Perseus Jackson, said the right face, but for now it's Annabeth's turn. He laughed giddily. <coughs> Shut up, so his left face said. This is serious. One bad choice can ruin your whole life. It can kill you and your friends. But no pressure, Annabeth. Choose. With a sudden chill, I remembered the words of the prophecy. Child of Athena's final stand. Don't do what I said. I'm afraid she has to, the right face said cheerfully. Annabeth moistened her lips. I, I choose, before she could point to a door, a brilliant light flooded the room. Janus raised his hands to either side of his head to cover his eyes. When the light died, a woman was standing, in the fount standing at the fountain. She was tall and graceful, with long hair, the color of chocolate, braided in plates of with gold ribbons. My water. 
She wore a simple white dress, but when she moved, the fabric shimmered with colors like oil on water. Janus, are we causing trouble again? she asked. No, my lady, Janus's right face stammered. Yes, the left face said. Shut up, the right face said. Excuse me, the woman asked. Not you, my lady. I was talking to myself. I see, the lady said. You know very well your visit is premature. The girl's time has not yet come. So I give you a choice. Leave these heroes to me, or I shall turn you into a door and break you down. What kind of a door? The left face asked. Shut up, the right face said. Because French doors are nice, the left face mused. Lots of natural light. Shut up, the right face wailed. Not you, my lady. Of course I'll leave. <coughs> I was just having a bit of fun, doing my job, offering choices. Causing indecision, the woman corrected. Now be gone, the left face muttered. Party pooper. Then he raised his silver key, inserted it into the air, and disappeared. The woman turned toward us, and fear closed around my heart. Her eyes shined with power. Leave these heroes to me. That didn't sound good. For a second, I almost wish we would have taken our chances with Janus. But then the woman smiled. You must be hungry, she said. Sit with me and talk. She waved her hand, and the Roman fountain began to flow. Jets of clear water sprayed into the air. A marble table appeared, laden with platters of sandwiches and pitchers of lemonade. Who, who are you? I asked. I am Hera, the woman smiled, queen of heaven. I'd seen Hera once before at, the council of, at a council of the gods, but I hadn't paid much attention to her. At the time, I'd been surrounded by a bunch of other gods who were debating whether or not to kill me. I didn't remember her looking so normal. Of course, gods are usually 20 feet tall when they're on Olympus, so that makes them look a lot less normal. But now Hera looked like a regular mom. She served us sandwiches and poured lemonade. Grover, dear, she said. Use your napkin. Don't eat it. Yes, ma'am, Grover said. Tyson, you're wasting away. Would you like another peanut butter sandwich? Tyson stifled a belch. Yes, nice lady. Queen Hera, Annabeth said. I can't believe it. What are you doing in the labyrinth? Hera smiled. She flicked one finger and Annabeth's hair combed itself. All the dirt and grime disappeared from her face. I came to see you, naturally, the goddess said. Grover and I exchanged nervous looks. Usually when the gods come looking for you, it's not out of the goodness of their hearts. It's because they want something. Still, that didn't keep me from chowing down on turkey and Swiss sandwiches and chips and lemonade. I hadn't realized how hungry I was. Tyson was inhaling one peanut butter sandwich after another, and Grover was loving the lemonade, crunching the styrofoam cup like an ice cream cone. I don't think... Annabeth faltered. Well, I, I didn't think you liked heroes. Hera smiled indulgently. Because of that little spat I had with Hercules. Honestly, I get so much bad press because of one disagreement. Didn't you try to kill him, like, a lot of times? Annabeth asked. Hera waved her hand dismissively. Water under the bridge, my dear. Besides, he was one of my loving husband's children by another woman. My patience wore thin, I'll admit it. But Zeus and I have had excellent marriage counseling sessions since then. We've aired our feelings and come to an understanding, especially after that last little incident. You mean when he sired Thalia? I guessed, but immediately wished I hadn't. As soon as I said the name of our friend, the half-blood daughter of Zeus, Hera's eyes turned toward me frostily. Percy Jackson, isn't it? One of Poseidon's children. I was thinking, she, I got the feeling she was thinking another word besides children. As I recall, I voted you to live, I voted to let you live at the winter solstice. I hope I voted correctly. She turned back to Annabeth with a sunny smile. At any rate, I certainly bear, bear you no ill will, my dear. I appreciate the difficulty of your quest. Especially when you have troublemakers like Janus to deal with. Annabeth lowered her gaze. Why was he here? He was driving me crazy. 
trying to, Hera agreed. You must understand, the minor gods like Janus have always been frustrated at the, by the small parts they play in the universe. Some, I fear, have little love for Olympus and could easily be swayed to raise support, could be swayed to support the rise of my father. Your father? I said. Oh, right. I'd forgotten that Kronos was Hera's dad, too, along with being the father to Zeus, Poseidon, and all the eldest Olympians. I guess that made Kronos my grandfather, but that thought was so weird I put it out of my mind. We must watch the minor gods, Hera said. Janus, Hecate, Morpheus. They give lip service to Olympus, and yet... That's where Dionysus went, I remembered. He was checking on the minor gods. Indeed. Hera stared at the fading mosaics of the Olympians. You see, in times of trouble, even gods can lose faith. They start putting their trust in the wrong things. Petty things. They stop looking at the big picture and start being selfish. But I am the goddess of marriage, you see. I'm used to perseverance. You have to rise above the squabbling and chaos and keep believing. You have to keep your goals in mind. What are your goals? Annabeth asked. She smiled. To keep my family, the Olympians, together, of course. At the moment, the best way I can do that is by helping you. Zeus does not allow me to interfere much, I am afraid. But every century or so, for a quest I care deeply about, he allows me to grant a wish. A wish? Before you ask it, let me give you some advice which I can do for free. I know you seek Daedalus. His labyrinth is mu as much a mystery to me as it is to you. But if you want to know his fate, I would visit my son Hephaestus at his forge. Daedalus was a great inventor, a mortal after Hephaestus's heart. There has never been a mortal Hephaestus admired more. If anyone could keep up with Daedalus and could tell you his fate, it is Hephaestus. But how do we get there? Annabeth asked. That's my wish. I want a way to navigate the labyrinth. Hera looked disappointed. So be it. You wish for something, however, you, that you have already been given. I don't understand. The means is already within your grasp. She looked at me. Percy knows the answer. I do? But that's not fair, Annabeth said. You're not telling me what it is. Hera shook her head. Getting something and having the wits to use it. Those are two different things. I'm sure your mother Athena would agree. The room rumbled like distant thunder. Hera stood. That would be my cue. Zeus grows impatient. Think on what I have said. Annabeth, seek out Hephaestus. You will have to pass through the ranch, I imagine, but keep going. And use all the means at your disposal, however common they may seem. She pointed toward the two doors and they melted together, reeling to melted away, revealing twin, twin corridors, open and dark. One last thing, Annabeth. I have postponed the day of choice. I have not prevented it. Soon, as Janus said, you will have to make a decision. Farewell. She waved a hand and turned into white smoke. So did the food, just as Tyson chomped down on a sandwich that turned to mist in his mouth. The fountain trickled to a stop. The mosaic walls dimmed and turned grungy and faded again. The room was no longer any place you'd want to have a picnic. Annabeth stamped her foot. What sort of help was that? Here, have a sandwich, make a wish. Oops, I can't help you. Poof. Poof, and Tyson agreed sadly, looking at his empty plate. Well, Grover sighed. She said Percy knows the answer. That's something. They all looked at me. But I don't, I said. I don't know what she was talking about. Annabeth sighed. All right, then we'll just keep going. Which way? I asked. I really wanted to ask Hera what Hera had meant about the choice Annabeth needed to make. <clears throat> but then Grover and Tyson both tensed. They stood up together like they'd rehearsed it. Left, they both said. Annabeth frowned. How can you be sure? Because something is coming from the right, Grover said. Something big, Tyson agreed. In a hurry. Left is sounding pretty good, I decided. And together we plunged into the dark corridor. Thus ends chapter six. Chapter seven is Tyson Lead the Jailbreak. And that's a fantastic chapter. We will get, that I will read tomorrow. 
Ooh, an email. Um, it's Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Um, there's going to be some new information coming out if you're listening to this on Wednesday. Um, there's going to be some new information coming about coming out about what we're going to be doing as a class. Um, I'm still planning on getting you something next week as far as packets goes, but coming after that, it looks like we're going to be doing a little bit more in the um, actual online class type of thing, which means that there will be actual videos that I will be requiring you to watch. I know yesterday I said a lot of, hey, nothing's required, it's all supplemental, but that's going to change um, as things continue to evolve um, in the world. However, um, those of you who have my number, it's still available open. I'm As long as it's daylight outside, you can call me. Um, you can comment on the links. Um, I might, I'll try to comment, uh, open, I'll think about opening links to comment on um, Google Classroom. And I, I checked yesterday to see that you can't actually comment on the video. So I'll look into that. Why are you drinking my cold tea, Cassiopeia? The kitten is drinking the tea cup that I, drinking out of the tea cup that I left on the table this morning. So I won't let her drink my water. Um, but I hope you enjoyed chapters five and six. Um, you should know some of the stories they talked about with Theseus, how his dad died. How did his dad die? You should know that. We read the story Theseus and the Minotaur, the hero and the Minotaur a couple weeks back. Um, what did Theseus do or not do rather that caused his father to die? Um, and you, with with that in mind, you might have an inkling of an idea of who Nico's ghost king is. That'll re be revealed later in the book. But um, with what we learned from Theseus, we might know who our ghost king is. See if we can figure it out, and I'll see about opening comments or something. Um, but have a good afternoon. Uh, stay home. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Uh, Cassiopeia says farewell. Don't you sweet pea. Stay out of my water.